Welcome again to Surgery Grand Rounds. I'm very excited about today's topic. Um, one of the only um, type of injuries that we send out to a higher level of care from our trauma hospital is usually a, a complex orthopedic injury such as a pelvic fracture. So this is always something that we are concerned about and evaluating and, and, uh, and we need more education and uh, information about this. So, so today is going to be a great lecture and I'm very pleased to welcome John Soika. Uh, Dr. Soika received his medical degree at University of Kansas. He did his residency at Crichton University and he did his orthopedic uh, fellowship in Indianapolis. And he's currently on staff at the University of Kansas in Kansas City. And we're very pleased to have him today to talk about damage control in orthopedics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. So I have two talks today, uh, the first of which is sort of the background or the backbone, if you will, of uh, damage control orthopedics, which is uh, a concept that uh, back in my training days uh, was a little bit uh, new. Uh, even uh, this is probably subsequent to my training days. Uh, when I first was training, we would try to get everything done as soon as we could uh, for various reasons, operating room availability, uh, the patient's condition, um, you know, open fractures, things of that nature. This is kind of newer technology, probably really pushed forward within the last seven to eight years. Uh, and I think that uh, it's really been beneficial as far as patient care with respect to systemic injury, especially uh, cardiopulmonary injury as a result of traumatic orthopedic injuries. So. Uh, the first talk will sort of set the stage and then the second part of it, and, and I would encourage you, to, I'm very informal, stop me at any point. I have four children all under the age of 14 so I get stopped all the time. Please feel free to, to uh, ask the questions, uh, it, it, otherwise you'll forget them. Uh, long story short, the second talk will then be kind of a case example that we can apply some of this uh, fund of knowledge to and hopefully it'll, it'll clarify some of the concepts or points that I'm trying to uh, bring home to you here today. Okay? All right. Without further ado. So what is DCO or what is damage control orthopedics? It's basically a, a shift in our paradigm or our way of thinking in terms of a philosophy. Uh, it talks about the management of the patient with multiple bony injuries. The fundamental principles are that fractures and traumatic soft tissue injuries or the wound organ should be stabilized promptly with the minimum physiological insult to the patient. And that initial, initial surgery should be regarded as a staged part of the resuscitation pro process. So we don't necessarily have to go in right away and do everything all at once just because we've got them in the operating room under a general anesthetic. We have to look at the entire picture and the scope of the patient's, patient's resuscitation with respect to what, get, what gets done and when. How do we get there? Well, we have to revisit the ABCs of trauma, right? Airway, breathing, circulation, all of those things. We've got to consider what are absolute emergencies, what are relative emergencies, what are life-threatening or limb-threatening injuries, and then talk about how does that diagnosis impact or affect the patient's overall outcome. We have to understand the two-hit hypothesis and systemic inflammatory response or SIRS which is really mediated by interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 and I'm not going to get into a lot of uh, biochemistry here because God knows that it was hard enough to get through during medical school. Uh, so I'll, I'll just share with you that there are concrete reasons why damage control orthopedics is important. We have to work from my subspecialty with the general surgery colleagues in order to uh, optimize the patient's uh, uh, participation in their own care. So let's talk about absolute emergencies and this is one that I apologize if you're still eating but uh, it, it happens, right? Uh, 
So uh, the open book pelvis fracture. What is an open book pelvis fracture? We think of the pelvis as a ring, okay, or a pretzel. You can't break a pretzel in one spot. It's always broken in two spots, right? When you break off a pretzel, it breaks in the front and in the back. When we talk about a book, the back binding of the book is usually the back portion of the pelvis, right? The sacrum, the SI joints. And so when we open the pelvis up front, an open book pelvis fracture looks like this x-ray here on the left. This is what it might present as. You might have lacerations in the region that may or may not communicate with bone. If it does communicate with bone, then we're talking about open pelvic ring injuries, and those can be uh, very catastrophic. The diagnosis, obviously, is definitively made by x-ray, but you have to have a suspicion with mechanism of injury. How do you do that? Let's talk about mechanisms. The motorcycle rider that maybe is not paying attention, looking over to the side and, and rear ends a car. Okay, that pelvic ring is going to, it's a straddle injury, right? They're going to they're gonna encounter the front portion of the motorcycle. Uh, a lot of times in the summer we see a, a host of them on jet skis. They'll run it up onto a sandbar or up onto, the, up onto the beach trying to park these things and that sudden deceleration will open up the anterior pelvis. So the, the mechanism of, of injury provides us with uh, an opportunity to uh, recognize the severity of the injury. There's usually obvious deformity. With pelvic ring injuries that are open in the front, you have hyper external rotation of the legs. And so if somebody's sitting on a gurney, their legs will be essentially laid out flat. Tonight when you go home, go to bed, lay on your back, you'll see that we all externally rotate our legs just a little bit. We don't lay with our feet straight up pointing toward the ceiling. But you'll recognize that hyper external rotation when you see it. Other clues that, uh, that can be uh, Right in front of us include hemorrhagic shock, a vascular or neurologic deficiency in the lower extremity, and an expanding low, uh, lower abdomen with labial or scrotal swelling, depending upon the uh, gender of the patient. The initial treatment, we follow the ATLS protocol. We use pelvic binders or sheets to close down that intrapelvic volume. We use volume replacement. We use external fixation once we have the opportunity to, to hopefully get them to the operating room. Uh, we can use what we call resuscitation frames, single pin frames, just to get us within the ballpark, put the two uh, hemipelvies within the same zip code, so to speak. This is very quick and very effective. This is an example up top. The radiograph obviously shows a uh, male patient uh, with a widely displaced pelvic ring injury. Uh, how do you resuscitate that patient? You know, it's difficult to do. What we're trying to do is add volume to the patient uh, with a certain prescription or a certain uh, uh, recipe for resuscitating them, but it's difficult to do if you can't close that pelvic volume down. I make the analogy, it'd be like trying to fill this room with water and having the doors wide open. So we gotta close down that pelvic volume in order to resuscitate that patient. The mortality rate in these is, is very high. It's uh, upwards of 25% or one out of four of these patients. Um, there's hemorrhage with shock in 75% of these patients. There's urogenital injury in about 12% of these patients. And there's lumbosacral plexus injuries in about 8% of these patients. Think about this one. 60 to 80% of these patients with high energy pelvis fractures have other musculoskeletal injuries. So we talk about distracting injuries. These can distract you from something else going on, right? Maybe a humerus fracture, maybe a proximal humerus fracture, maybe a you know ankle fracture. Uh, so I would encourage you to make sure that you're fastidious with respect to your secondary survey so that we don't miss things. And certainly the outcomes are dependent upon the associated injuries. The isolated pelvis fracture, it occurs occasionally. Uh, we just had one come in, a uh, horseback rider. The horse bucked on him and, and as the swale of the saddle comes up and he's coming back down from the initial kick, he breaks his pelvis. So what do we do for the open book pelvis fracture? Damage control orthopedics would tell us that it's easy to put an external fixator on. This is an example of a two pin frame, two pins into the iliac crest on each side. Close down the pelvic volume and build your frame outside of that. Definitive management is then later SI screws on the affected uh, sacroiliac side and plate fixation because these patients hate definitive management of uh, pelvic ring with external fixation. Uh, 
It's like the old TVs walking around, you know, with the rabbit ears. They can't stand it. Occasionally we have to do stuff like that, especially in the face of open fractures. Another uh, relative absolute uh, emergency would be the long bone fractures. Long bones are the femur, the tibia, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. Approximately 60% of all long bone fractures are isolated injuries. Again, 40%, nearly one half. So don't let these be distracting injuries. It's pretty impressive. It takes a lot of energy to break your femur. So the abdomen, the chest, and other fractures are things that we don't want to overlook. How about open fractures? I sort of glossed over that a little bit, but the diagnosis is usually pretty obvious. But the Gastillo-Anderson classification will tell us that, you know, the, the type 1s, those are poke hole injuries. Those are usually inside out injuries. So the bone's fractured, and then a sharp shard of the bone will come and penetrate the skin from the inside out. Typically, those are a lot less uh, at risk for infection than the, ins than the outside in injuries or the wide open injuries. Uh, various causes, but you can see that over half of these are caused by uh, some sort of moving motor vehicle, whether it be motorcycles or cars. The definitive diagnosis for a long bone fracture is typically made by x-ray, but you have a high index of suspicion when they come in through the emergency room or trauma bay uh, with guarding or lack of use or obvious deformity. Okay. The initial treatment of these, uh, you manage the soft tissue injuries first, okay? We typically take these as, as rapidly as we can, as long as the patient's stable, to the operating room. Early IV antibiotics, uh, I think Jeff Anglin, who used to be uh, in Columbia, has shown that, that that's really important. Early IV antibiotics to cover the open wounds. Uh, then aggressive debridement in the operating room, and that includes debridement of bone. If there's bone without soft tissue attachment, how do you fight infection, right? We got ways of transporting bone or, or making up that bony deficit, but if you've got a piece of bone that's left in the wound that has no soft tissue attachments, that's foreign material. There's no way to, no way to get white cells to that, certainly no way to get antibiotics on top of that. Then. Initial skeletal stabilization can include splints or external fixation. And then timely soft tissue coverage. I have uh, the distinct pleasure and blessing of, of having two partners that do uh, soft tissue coverage procedures. Just yesterday we did one. Uh, and it's a huge benefit. I don't have to rely on a plastic surgery team. I've got my own orthopedic partners, Dr. Bruce Toby and Dr. Michael Tilley. Uh, and Dr. Jake Brubaker, who all do soft tissue coverage for us so we can handle it within our own department, which is really nice. And then, of course, tetanus prophylaxis. The uh, typical prophylactic antibiotics include first-generation gen cephalosporins, and we use clindamycin if there's a penicillin allergy, occasionally vancomycin, and then penicill penicillin for clostridia-prone wounds. I hesitate for just a minute to, to go back to that Gastillo-Anderson classification. So the type 1s are the inside out injuries. It goes all the way up to the type 3 C's which are the open injuries that require uh, vascular intervention. Okay, So this would be something that we would consider a, a 3 C but it's not reconstructable. So what do we do? Well we typically just recognize the injury, realign it and splint it do a thorough neurovascular exam to find out is it, you know, is it something that we can salvage. Cover the wound with a sterile dressing. Back in my day we used to use betadine dressings. We've now decided or, or discovered that uh, betadine is probably not all that friendly to osteocytes. So if you have exposed bone I just prefer a regular saline dressing. Get radiographs and splint it and ship it. Wound colonization. Initial colonization of a traumatic wound obviously increases with time. You therefore need to debride the necrotic muscle, any dead space or poorly vascularized tissues. And again, include in that debridement bone. If it does not have a soft tissue attachment, that bone is a, a foreign material to that wound. Think of it this way, it can't defend itself because it doesn't have access to white cells. Our goal then is to convert those traumatic wounds to a surgical wound with debridement of all devitalized tissue, skin, fascia, and bone. 
the patient obviously must receive IV antibiotics promptly and the typical school of thought is within six hours. There's a host of uh, orthopedic literature now that, that is sort of debating that, but I think clearly we know that earlier is better with respect to outcomes. We want to restore vascularity. If, that, if that's as simple as realigning the limb, so be it. If it requires vascular intervention, uh, then the, the time crunch is on, right? You want to stabilize those skeletal injuries with just simple things like splints. Occasionally if you have access to an orthopedic surgeon at an outside facility and they can put a quick X fix on, that's a great thing. And then we determine at that point then, you know, is it early total orthopedic care or do we do the damage control orthopedics? Do we have to take them back for serial debridements? If we're going to have to do something like that wound that you just saw that was grossly contaminated, I don't necessarily want to have my definitive fixation on there early. I'd rather take them back. I've taken people back 12, 14 times over the course of four, uh, four to five weeks uh, to make certain that that wound is clean before I put my definitive, whatever it is, intramedullary nail, uh, plate, you name it. Some of the late concerns, repair of nerves, repair of musculotendinous units, and then we plan our reconstructions depending upon what needs to get done bone transport, things of that nature. So this is all done when the patient is best physiologically able to uh, be taken to the operating room. And I work very closely with my anesthesia colleagues when it comes to this. I certainly also, and I put this one in there because when the best team is available for reconstructions, I'm a big fan of having my A team in the room with me because they know what I need. I don't necessarily try to do this stuff in the middle of the night or on a weekend. I like to have my regular crew. When we talk about external fixa fixation, what kind of frame types are we talking about? Well, there's several different kinds, but usually simpler is better as long as it's stable. With the tibia, I like a simple unilateral frame. Uh, around an ankle or if I'm spanning the ankle joint, I like a delta frame. Two pins in the tibia and then a transcalcaneal pin, something right through the tuberosity of the calcaneus, of the heel bone. It's centrally threaded, you can grab that and you make just this little triangle or delta frame around the ankle. Occasionally you'll have marked comminution or unstable fragments uh, that'll cause severe pain, uh, they will uh, create continued uh, swelling and so I'll want uh, multiplanar or biplanar frames and there's a host of different things that we can do for that um, and I would suggest to you that you know a lot of these external fixation devices if you don't have practice doing it put something simple on or put them in skeletal traction and get the patient to us as, as rapidly as you can. There's other things like circular frames that, that we use as well as hybrid frames. And again, unless you've got a lot of experience putting these on, they can be somewhat intimidating uh, at first or they can be frankly um, uh, frustrating to put on because uh, we have a lot of reps that come in and will participate in the, uh, in the case with us to help us uh, when we have small segments or segments that are very near joints. Uh, so those are things that complicate it and so uh, we have to have uh, the ability to sort of uh, react to the situation as it, as it arises and, and circular frames or hybrid frames where you're using a combination of a fine wire frame and a heavy pin frame uh, help conquer those problems. Let's go back to soft tissue management just a little bit. We see a lot of really complex wounds. Um, I grew up in, in small town Columbus, Nebraska, and I remember my father was a general surgeon. I remember dad always coming home, and, and this was back in the day of the slides. And he'd say, grab my camera, I got slide film in there. And I'd pedal my bicycle over to the, to the hospital and give it to him because he had something from a PTO. I mean, power takeoffs still create horrendous injuries. Uh, farm machinery, uh, all of those things in the Midwest are, are uh, real problems when it comes to uh, people being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So soft tissue management is a, is a key component to this. Uh, I like using wound vac systems and I'm not going to uh, tout any particular company's wound vac over another, but 
they all work very well. We did not necessarily have these when I first started my training uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and a lot of these soft tissues got covered with just uh, saline soaked gauze. Uh, what happens is you get the skin edges retracting and the wound is actually bigger by the time you get done with it because we've all seen those kind of woody appearance to the wounds as they've been multiply debrided. Uh, and it becomes a real problem for coverage. If you can put a little soft tissue tension across their Roman sandal technique is what we call it, uh, where we take just uh, surgical staples and uh, vessel loops and just string them back and forth almost like you're lacing your shoes and you put a staple in wherever the, the grommet or the, the hole in your, in your shoe would be and you lace those things up and you pull on those little rubber bands, the, vas the uh, vessel loops, that'll create enough soft tissue tension to kind of not necessarily close the wound but at least provide you with uh, some soft tissue tension so that you don't get the bad retraction of the skin edges. This gives you an example. You can kind of see the the red vessel loops at the bottom of the of the uh, pictures here where we're crossing them back and forth and I'll put this over top of a wound back sponge and so you you're kind of providing that constant negative pressure to the wound to keep the drainage from accumulating and you're also providing soft tissue coverage so it's it's almost like that hermetic seal that you uh, uh, that you can buy at the grocery store so this really works well in terms of shrinking down the size of the wound, whether it be for skin grafting or for free tissue transfer or local tissue transfer as well. The applications vary widely, and this is important to recognize too. You know, in, in this particular instance, I was placing a, a wound vac on there in addition to uh, placing drains so that they, the uh, continued oozing of the soft tissues, because this is a degloving injury all the way down, you know that whole venous plexus throughout that uh, limb was really disrupted and they, they will continue to ooze especially if they're on some of the new modern day drugs the Plavix or, or even some of the older ones the Warfarins or Coumadins um, and I think that this really works well to help drain the wound uh, while at the same time providing a nice seal so that you're not continuing the, the colonization process if you will. Is that black foam or white foam or what's on your periphery? Uh, I, I line the outside of my wounds with Xeriform so that they don't get real, uh, they get macerated otherwise. They kind of, that tissue gets real wet and, and weepy. So the outcomes. I tell the medical students when I'm giving my lectures, I mean, how many would take a 98% union rate in a close, you know, on a, on a or 98% uh, uh, pass on a, on a test, on a shelf exam, they all raise their hand. Well, we've come quite a ways in the last 20 to 30 years with respect to long bone fixation. I mean, a closed femoral shaft fracture, roughly 98% union rate with intramedullary fixation of the femoral shaft. Now, that's isolated to a certain specific fracture type, but that's pretty dang good. 92% union rate with internal fixation or intramedullary nailing of tibial shaft fractures, and the drop-off kind of stands to reason. I mean, if you think about the femur, it's surrounded 360 degrees by muscle, which is a great blood source for the, for the bone. And in the tibia, you've got about a third of your tibia, we call it our shin, that's really not covered with bone. It's just skin and subcutaneous fat. So the, the, uh, the blood supply to the tibia is not nearly what it is to the femur. 92% union rate with humerus fractures and a 93% union rate with uh, forearm fractures. So these are all quoted out of Browner and Jupiter, which is uh, one of our skeletal trauma books that we use uh, and it's uh, kind of a Bible for us. These numbers, of course, vary based upon the study quoted, the fracture pattern, and other associated injuries. But by and large, we have the ability to fix these fractures and make them work. Open fractures, well, Dr. Dellinger et al. reported that infections were three times more common in the leg than in the arm. Could be the proximity to the, to the ground, it could be a host of other things such as blood supply. The rate of infection increased with increasing severity, and that stands to reason too. As you do more damage to the soft tissues or the blood supply to that bone, you run the risk of not delivering as much white cells or, or IV antibiotics to that bone. So with the type 1's, you've got about a 7% risk of infection all the way up to the type 3B and 3C. These are the ones that require vascular intervention, the 3C's. You've got over half of these get infectious. Damage control orthopedics in even some of these cases. I mean, this was sent from an outside facility to our institution, and uh, this is one where 
there's not much to do. That's all free bone in the center there, so a, a elaborate external fixture is probably a good idea if you're not the one that's going to make the decision to amputate. And this individual did get an amputation. Definitive management may be amputation, it may be plate fixation, it may be intramedullary fixation, but by and large, in the upper extremities, kind of the gold standard as a general rule is plate fixation to allow compression of the fracture fragments, and in the lower extremities, if, if it's amenable to it, is intramedullary fixation. Another absolute emergency, we see this a lot, compartment syndrome. And amandola and twaddle, I've not found a better definition than this. It's a condition characterized by raised pressure within a closed space with the potential to cause irreversible damage to the contents of that closed space. It's like putting a blood pressure cuff on and leaving it on. The compartment syndrome physiology, there's really three main portions to it. Uh, I would probably reverse this order if I was going to rewrite this talk, but I think the important thing to remember is time-dependent physiology. You have to react to this in a timely fashion once you have the suspicion for a compartment syndrome. It's based upon uh, the gas constants, so as, as you get increasing pressure, pressure within that closed space, you're not going to have the ability for oxygen to diffuse across cell membranes and nourish a cell. In addition, there's incompressibility of the liquids. So those liquids are pumping in there and that pressure is increasing. There, there's really no uh, outlet for those soft tissues and they start to die. We used to teach back in the 90s when I was a student uh, the six P's with respect to that. But really there's two P's. You get to the late findings and the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. It's usually pressured, pressure with a turgid compartment and shiny skin. We've all seen those really, really swollen legs. The skin looks almost, uh, uh, at times, almost iridescent. It's, it's so shiny that it's almost glowing. And then, of course, there's pain out of proportion. They have an increased narcotic demand. And that pain is usually to passive stretch. So if it's in the lower leg, all you got to do is take their big toe and, and take it through a range of motion. And just the, the process of taking that tendon through that compartment will light that person up. They'll want to come off the table and slug you. So paresthesias, all those other findings are late, and pulselessness is typically not a characteristic of a compartment syndrome. Pulselessness will typically uh, is a hallmark of a crush syndrome, however. Here you get an idea. You've got a hemorrhagic fracture blister. You can start to see the shininess of the skin, not just at the fracture site, but in the surrounding regions. And this is just uh, the top right is a netter uh, illustration of the four compartments, the anterior, the lateral, the superficial posterior compartment, and the deep posterior compartment. Those all have to be released in order to maintain healthy physiology. Treatment of compartment syndrome is emergent fasciotomy. It's analogous to a closed head injury. We can have abdominal compartment syndrome. It's, you've got to relieve that swelling. And so the emergent fasciotomies in the forearm are well described. Uh, occasionally we'll have to do them in the hand. You can do them in the thigh, the leg, uh, the foot, even the abdomen as I alluded to earlier. The outcomes, again, I want to stress, this is time dependent physiology. So if somebody says, hey, I think this person has a compartment syndrome, if you haven't seen it, grab somebody that's seen it because we do this all the time with our residents. They say, hey, you know, John, I got this. I think it's the real deal. Will you come with me? And then I grab as many residents as I can because you learn every time you see one. And every, every presentation is slightly clinically just a little bit different. So early diagnosis equals better outcome. And then damage control orthopedics, get the patient transported if you're not available or have somebody available that can do those fasciotomies for you. Talk about crush injuries. So I trained in Indianapolis, um, and I don't know if you guys saw the accident this past weekend. That was uh, horrific. This is kind of what a typical Indy Speedway foot looks like after the, the nose cone comes off and the front end of the car slaps against the wall at about 200 miles an hour. Crush injuries can be difficult to distinguish between them and a compartment syndrome. However, 
you got to understand that with a crush injury, the injury to the muscle and the nerve occurs at the time of the crush. With compartment syndrome, it's time dependent physiology, so you still have a possibility to intervene. With a cut, crush injury, that nerve is squashed, that muscle is squashed, and you're going to be debriding it. So neurovascular injury oftentimes, oftentimes will preclude a good outcome in crush injuries. The goal, however, is a viable, stable, sensate extremity. The alternative is amputation. And about 10 years ago, when I first uh, arrived back at KU for a while there, after um, we were seeing a lot of soldiers coming back from overseas, uh, crush injuries, whether it be from the blasts or whatever, IEDs, they were coming in and they had done a wonderful job of salvaging these limbs, but they were begging for amputation because they had such bad neurogenic pain. So keep in mind, the goal is a viable, stable, sensate extremity. If it's insensate or it's horribly painful, they would rather walk on a prosthesis. And I've got a host of patients that will attest to that. Again, the diagnosis can be difficult with respect to a crush injury. This is the x-ray of that foot that we saw just a little bit ago. This is a tibial pilon injury uh, at the ankle, shattered ankle with articular surface extension. And then he's got a host of fractures. Uh, you can see these meta second, third metatarsals. This actually was a Lis Frank type injury. Uh, he had a calcaneus fracture on that side as well. The initial treatment is fluid resuscitation. You want to avoid high concentrations of that muscle breakdown. It'll, it'll box your kidneys. And so you want to pay particular attention to renal function as you're doing this. You want to use provisional stabilization, splints, not cast. You don't want anything circumferential on this. And then you want to get them to the nearest hospital. And I say plus or minus compartment releases because if we can do something to debride some of that dead muscle, perhaps it won't go into central venous circulation and contribute to uh, renal dysfunction. Here's an example. We opened this guy up and, and decompressed all nine compartments in his foot and, and basically we were digging out a bunch of hematoma and dead muscle. Uh, obviously the outcomes are dependent upon the severity of the crush, the renal function, and other associated injuries. This guy went back to driving. <coughs> Relative emergencies, joint dislocations. We talk about knee, hip, elbow, shoulder, ankle, and wrist are, are the big ones. The diagnosis is definitively made by x-ray, but the clinical clues again include deformity, the guarding or lack of use, and a neurovascular compromise. Here's some examples. This is the top left is a rotatory knee dislocation. This is uh, a lot less life-threatening or limb-threatening. This is a very uncomfortable one, which is usually, uh, this is a patellar dislocation, a lateral subluxation of the patella. The patella just jumps out of the trochlea there. This is an obturator dislocation of the hip. You can see the, the sort of the telltale sign, the dashboard injury, and all that energy went up into the acetabulum to probably, most likely in this case, create a, uh, an acetabulum fracture with subsequent dislocation. And then, of course, an elbow dislocation, posterior elbow dislocation. How do we treat these? Well, recognition of the event helps. Excuse me. Prompt splinting of the injured extremity is important. You want prompt transport to the emergency department. Assess the vascular status. This is huge. And then timely and atraumatic reduction. If you're doing a reduction, and it always kind of gets me because you'll see, uh, and I'm not trying to pick on coaches or athletic trainers or anything like that. I just, I've been to enough football games where you see somebody will do a, you know, they'll dislocate a finger and you'll see them just yanking on it. A coach will yank on it. That's not really an atraumatic reduction. I think it's more appropriate to get an x-ray to see, you know, is it buttonholing through capsule? Is what's, what's going on? Because as they start doing that, you can actually do more injury by just pulling on that finger or pulling on that joint, whatever it might be, uh, as far as the articular cartilage or the joint surface goes. So prompt splinting, prompt transport to the emergency department, and then a timely and atraumatic reduction is what we're after. The outcomes vary. There are factors that influence the outcome, which include the energy absorbed by the joint surface. You know, is there any shearing that's been done to the articular cartilage? The amount of time that the joint was dislocated. The condition of the joint surface, both pre and post reduction. The associated soft tissue injuries around the joint capsule, uh, the muscle. The blood supply to the bone ends, has that been disrupted? Do we worry about things like avascular necrosis around the hip? 
So in summary, Damage Control Orthopedics is a partnership with our trauma surgery colleagues. It's part of the entire resuscitation process and the timing of those procedures is usually as per the trauma service recommendations and I would insert also as per the anesthesia recommendations because they're the ones that have to deal with obviously some of the lung issues. So damage control orthopedics seeks to avoid provoking a severe systemic inflammatory response. Those primary mediators again are interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 uh, but we can certainly make a difference because as we do things like reaming an intramedullary canal uh, we're going to increase that risk for pulmonary injury uh, and I would say that that's probably not in the patient's best interest if they're still in the process of being resuscitated. Technical tricks for long bone and pelvic fractures uh, include external fixation with splints or immobilizers as temporary uh, provisional stabil uh, stabilization devices. We combine our soft tissue management and bone triage with thorough debridement and IV antibiotic coverage and we treat that whole wound as a wound organ. And that's the reason I do it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? And then I'll jump, I think I left some time so that we can jump into that other talk which is pretty quick. With an open book fracture of the pelvis, do you automatically do a retrograde urethrogram or only if there are signs uh, that might suggest they have that? Um, that's a great question. So typically uh, if they have an open book pelvis fracture, uh, I will ask that they get, first of all, they get a, every male gets a digital rectal exam, every female gets a digital rectal exam because we've had, uh, and it's been documented in the orthopedic literature, missed open, open book pelvis fractures. Every female with an open book pelvis fracture gets a uh, vaginal exam. And I typically ask the OB folks to come and do that because they're used to seeing what's normal and what's not normal. With regard to retrograde, if it's uh, not possible to pass the Foley, we ask not to keep pushing it. That's usually when they get the uh, retrograde sister urethrograms. And if the patient has to go to surgery for a laparotomy and let's say a suprapubic tube, does that affect how you fixate the pelvis? Yes, absolutely. So. Suprapubic catheters, um, I'm not a huge fan of them, but I, I, they're necessary. And so oftentimes if there's something that needs to be done anteriorly, if I'm going to plate an anterior ring, I'll avoid plating it until that suprapubic is either out, <coughs> excuse me, or until the bladder is repaired. <coughs> um, and I will treat them for a period of time with the X-Fix. Great question. What are your thoughts on the retroperitoneal packing of the pelvic fracture? Um, case by case, I guess, is the best answer. And I know I'm hedging when I, when I say that, but uh, we see a lot of times where the pelvic ring hasn't been adequate, adequately closed down with a binder or a sheet or an X-Fix, for that matter, coming from outside facilities. And so then you get them closed down and they start to perk up but you take them to the operating room and you open the abdomen. Well you've just thrown the door open again, right? So oftentimes uh, I'd rather see the X-Fix go on first and then get them to an interventional radiology suite to see what needs to be embolized before we start endeavoring to open a belly or, or a lower abdomen and pelvis. Does that make sense? I just Yeah, yeah I would agree with all that. <clears throat> I like to know where the bleeding's coming from first, and, and of course, it's easy for me to say that because I got interventional radiology over my shoulder, saying, "Hey, we're going to the we're going to the suite, and you can drop your X-fix pins right there, and you can use my fluoro scanner while while I'm doing while I'm squirting them." So, um, outside facilities probably don't have that luxury. So, I would say on a case by case basis, yeah, if, if that person is tanking, then you probably got to do something like that. You know, I've had to do it twice in the last couple of years and just for those reasons, you know, that whoever's on doesn't feel comfortable squirting something or, or embolizing something and then so in that case, so I've done a, I've opened things up, packed the retroperitoneum, and then called you. I guess what I'm leaning at is there's sometimes is a uh, is a rush to try to get somebody over they've got to open the pelvic, they need to get get to the orthopedic guy 
And my impression is, is most of the time when we end up transferring those, nothing gets done really to the fracture for a while until everything else sort of settles out. That's exactly right. I think that there's really this not, it's not an emergency to see an orthopedist. It's an emergency to stop the bleeding and stabilize the patient. That couldn't have been better said anywhere. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, we don't, we typically, as even as an orthopedic traumatologist, I'll say this, I don't typically deal with life and death situations. I deal with quality of life stuff. So, is the patient going to have a stable pelvic ring to walk again? Well, yeah, but I can, I got a week or 10 or 12 or 14 days, depending upon the age of the patient and their physiologic condition, to work on that. But by and large, if they're bleeding, we need to know what's the source of the bleeding. Can we embolize it? Do we need to pack it? What needs to be done? You know, if they're bleeding and it's, uh, you know, some abdominal injury, some hollow viscous injury, that probably needs to be explored. Um, you know, the CT scanners and guys that are sharper than me make those decisions, but I would say, if you're at an outside facility, you got to do what you got to do on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that that patient's adequately resuscitated. Because you might not have all the resources that I do working at a level one trauma center. And your thoughts on fecal diversion for uh, open pelvic fractures surgically versus medicinally? I mean, where you just kind of bind them up for a bit. What is I got a case-by-case -case basis too? Or? I'd rather have it done um, I'd rather have it done <laughs> as soon as they can get to us. If, if the pelvis fracture is that bad that they're going to need a diverting colostomy, uh, I think that, you know, I work very closely with our guys and gals that, you know, are on the general surgery trauma service. Now, does that mean that, you know, if you guys have an orthopedic surgeon here that you're comfortable with slapping a single pin or, or a, a res what I call a resuscitation frame on? Uh, and we'll go over that just here in a second, but uh, I think it's great and then doing a diverting colostomy so long as it's done in a way that it's not going to compromise me if I need to, you know, because then uh, I'm not saying we throw you under the bus. We weren't there. You guys did a great job to keep them alive to get them to us. We'll work around whatever, but it's nice to have those options still open. You know, if there's a if there's a diverting colostomy and I'm trying to do an acetabulum fracture on that same side, you know, it can get messy, no pun intended. I mean, it really can. And, and you start worrying about, am I going to get, you know, my hardware infected? I guess my question is, have you ever had any experience, rather than doing a surgical colostomy, giving them opioids or something to mechanically bind them up rather than doing something surgical? Well, um, no. I, I can't say that I've had that experience. I have seen uh, patients uh, that have come in with missed, essentially missed open fractures, you know, open pelvis, pelvis fractures that would require diverting colostomies and they were four, five, six, seven days at an outside facility and they were giving them their opioids to treat their pain and they're not moving, well, arresting their gut doesn't really treat the problem when it needs to be a surgical solution, if that makes sense. So, let's go through this and then, oh, go ahead, more question. After you reduce a, a posterior knee dislocation, how do you evaluate the popliteal artery? So that's a great question. It's, a, it's kind of a hot, tro uh, hot topic. Um, the gold standard in my mind is to do an arteriogram. But we'll have, I mean, we'll do ABIs. Um, but I think having that patient admitted, and if I have the opportunity to order it now, you know, there's other things that they can do. They can do CT arteriography and things of that nature. Um, I've seen two of those in the 13 years that I've been at KU that were missed, um, that had intimal flap tears. Uh, and those tears don't, you know, they can, the, the animal flap tear can, can be normal and then abnormal a minute later. So I like ABIs uh, and I like a, a, a constant observation, you know, every hour or two hours. Uh, we have residents that are in-house and that helps a ton. But if you're at all worried, I think the gold standard is probably still to, to squirt that leg.
Excellent question. All right, let's go through this. This is um, one that I think will... So this is a great case example in my opinion, sorry, in my opinion because it, it sort of gets to the, uh, to the gist of all the stuff that we're trying to accomplish uh, in these very ill patients. So this is an example. This is motorcycle versus parked vehicle. Uh, it happens. He was seen and evaluated in an outside hospital. He was then airlifted to KU. Uh, he had the following, a pelvic ring injury, a periprosthetic segmental left femur fracture. He had a Schatzker 6 right tibial plateau fracture. It, it goes 1 to 6, so 6 is the baddest. <laughs> Uh, he had a comminuted intraarticular left distal radius fracture and a probable pneumothorax. He also had mandible fractures. So this guy's got a lot going on. Think about it from an anesthesia point of view and not from an orthopedic point of view. He's coming in, he's got probable pneumo and he's got mandible fractures. So right away you're starting to think, oh, God, how am I gonna, how am I gonna ventilate this guy? How am I gonna, you know, airway, breathing, circulation, right? A, B, C, D, E, F. So here's a look at his AP pelvis. You can see he's got bilateral SI joint injuries. He's got an open pelvic ring. Here's a, a look at his segmental femur fracture. He's got that intercalary segment. He's got his femoral component stem where he fractured right at the tip of that, Vancouver A. And then he's got this supracondylar femur fracture. This actually he did have, you can't see it, but there's a drifting fracture fragment that goes into the joint there, but it's non-displaced at this point. So he's got a lot going on. Here's his tibial plateau fracture. Both medial and lateral condyles are knocked off. Uh, and then he's got comminution that goes into the metaphyseal region. Distal radius fracture, you can see the overlapping. This is just the this is a cross table sort of quick and dirty uh, study and you can see the articular surface is punched down you can see this butterfly fragment here you can see the edge of the uh, proximal fragment or the shaft fragment here so what to do this guy's not doing well his vital signs are a little bit shaky he's not breathing real well so the first thing that pops into my head is that which can kill you, right? Pelvic ring injuries can kill you. So I look at it and I go, okay, guys, we need a resuscitation frame. Have a large external fixator in the room on a Jackson table. Everybody knows what I mean, right? So I need a C-arm in there and we got that. I don't want to span his knee. He's got that horrible tibial plateau fracture. So I'm going to span his knee with a four pin X-fix. I'm going to put two pins in his tibia, two pins in his femur. So right now I've got four pins there two pins in his pelvic ring. So that's six pins total. That won't take me very much time. And then on the other side, the side that he's got that horrible segmental femur, how about if I just put proximal tibial traction on that? That's one pin. So now I'm talking seven pins and I'm out of the room and I can sugar tongue splint his left forearm. That's damage control orthopedics. I can get in there, get done what needs to get done, provide some provisional stabilization of all those fractures with seven pins and a splint. So this was all completed in under 45 minutes as the patient was becoming difficult to ventilate because it turns out, guess what? He did have a drop lung. So here's his single pin X-fix. I run those anterior to posterior right at the AIIS or the anterior inferior iliac spine. Gives me great control. I just use those as, as joysticks. I close his pelvic ring down, attach those bars to it while I'm holding it, have the residents or, or one of my partners tighten that thing down and now you've got his pelvic volume closed down and we did that in the time that I just gave this first part of the talk, so 10 minutes, right? Two pins in the femur and two pins in the tibia and I span that knee with a nice little elegant uh, external fixator and all of this stuff I can now take to a CT scanner when he's stable so that I can figure out what else do I need to do to this guy. How can I, I'm starting to plan my reconstruction as I'm doing my DCO or damage control orthopedics. So at what point am I going to do that? Well he's going to be in this for a while because this knee is swollen. I don't want to operate through soft tissues because because why? Because surgery is controlled trauma and as I operate he's going to continue to swell 
And so I don't want to be left with a wound or two, one on the inside and one on the outside, medial and lateral that I can't close and then require soft tissue coverage. So I'm thinking ahead I'm, I'm, and see how far away from the knee, I don't know if you can get a sense for that when you're looking at that, how far away from the knee I am with those pins so that if those pins do get colonized I can at least curette them and have my definitive fixation or my definitive hardware away from where those pin tracks were so I lessen my risk for any sort of long-term infection. Bless you. And so here he is with both frames out of each other's way and I still haven't addressed the segmental femurs on the other side. Here's my proximal tibial traction pin. I'd argue that's a little too low but I like them up here a little bit closer. But I certainly don't want them to penetrate the joint capsule because then you can infect the joint. So here is just a fluoro shot of where the pin was. This is another option for somebody like this. If he's really sick and trying to die on you, you can put a pelvic binder on and close their pelvic volume down. Worry less about their joints. If they're trying to die, who cares if they die with a beautiful x-ray? You've got to save that patient's life, right? So you, you put the binder on, you put the sheet on, whatever you have access to, to close down that pelvic volume. So here's what he, here's what he looked like uh, a few days later with a couple of SI screws put in. I haven't fixed him anteriorly yet. I just left this single pin X-fix on both sides, running these X-fix pins just above his uh, total hip arthroplasty on the left and just above his acetabulum on the right. And then he got four SI screws, two on each side in the back to close down his uh, bilateral SI joint injuries. And then his definitive fixation was delayed. I think this was probably almost a week and a half out. We did uh, plate fixation of his femur, so you had to deliver that femoral stem back into that intercalary segment. And then we plated that with a long plate and put uh, femoral strut allograph above that region as an additional uh, brace, if you will, to the anterior portion. And then got a nice reduction down at the distal portion. And then way later, two, two or three days later, I brought him back when he was still more stable to plate his uh, distal radius fracture. And that's it. So the point being, I'm not some hero. I like taking care of broken stuff. But I'm not smart enough to figure out by myself when is it appropriate to do this. I rely on guys that are smarter than I am to tell me, hey, this patient's not doing well probably not a good idea. So let's work together and arrive at a time when we can optimize you know, his pulmonary function, uh, maybe take a look at you know, his hemoglobin's a little low, let's get that up, let's do this, let's get him a couple more doses of antibiotics, let's make sure he's off of his pressors, let's make sure he's off of his anticoagulation or whatever else he's on to give me less blood loss in the operating room, perhaps less time in the operating room, uh, and that way I'm not distracted with my jigsaw puzzle, so to speak, and, and you know, worrying about somebody tanking on me. All right? Any questions? Thank you so much for letting me come to Joplin. I love it.